Everybody doing good this evening? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, obviously, my wife did an amazing job. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you want to see somebody that married out of their league, just take a look at my wife and I, and I'll let you determine who did what. So, um, but I'm actually, uh, I'm going to tell you the same thing that. Elizabeth Taylor told all of her husbands, and that is this, I won't keep you long. Um, but I, I understand that we are in a time, and I'm trying to get situated and connected here, so give me just a moment. You guys are in day seven of seeking the face of God. And so I want to talk to you for just a, just a couple of moments. I want to talk to you on this topic, the cure for compromise is consecration. The cure for compromise is consecration. So um, before I go, I know it's kind of been a little bit of a, a, a serious feel, but I like to smile, right? We're in church. It's good to smile when you're in church. Amen? Amen. So that's kind of why I made the joke, and you guys are probably still trying to figure out who married up. Um, but it definitely was not my wife. It definitely was not my wife. This isn't in my notes, but I just want to share something that came to me during worship in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. Verse number 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Now, that term there, reason together, is this. It is a, it is a legal term. It is a, it is a term that means come, let us come to a legal decision. And it's a term that is not about negotiating or compromise. It was for the people of God to come, the deci to, come to, to the decision of this. There is only one God that can cure us of our sinful nature. And so compromise and consecration is a battle that we all face. For some of us, it looks a lot different than for others. For some, compromising could be not posting that sarcastic remark on Facebook. And for others, it could be not watching television past 10 o'clock because nothing good is ever on TV past 10 o'clock. And I don't know what your battle is this evening, but I believe that it says that when the Bible says that when we come together, he'll meet us. Yes. Right where two or three are gathered together in his name, the Bible says that he is there in the midst. So the word consecrate, it means this, it means to be set apart for the service of God. And actually, before I go any further, uh, I know, how many of you have, have been at Shiloh since the beginning with Pastor Johnny? Anybody at all raise your hand? Do you guys know that Pastor Johnny and I are twin brothers? Do you guys know that? Uh, he got all the singing and preaching ability and I just got a little bit of the good look. So anyway, um, the word consecrate, I heard that, Travis. The word consecrate, it means this. It means to be set apart for the service of God. And there, were, there are four Hebraic words. I am, a, I am a definition junkie. I love definitions. I love looking at a word and tearing it apart and, and, make, and understanding, right? Because sometimes we say things in church and we really don't understand what it means, right? 10 days of consecration, that sounds really good and looks good on a flyer. And then I'm like, let's go a little bit deeper and see what consecration, because see what consecration means, because 
People are enamored about the thought of consecration until he comes and asks you to consecrate. Right? We're enamored by the idea of revival until revival starts coming in and asking us to change some things. Right? To turn off the television, to not watch the news, to... Right? And listen, if you're constantly in a state of revival, that means you're constantly dead. Right? Because the word revival means to live again. Right? And so many times we're addicted to the goosebump and he wants us to be used to the glory. Right, because listen, you can get a good get a good goosebump. Watch, you can get a goosebump watching a movie, right? Or here, Whitney, Whitney Houston, right? She used to hit that part in "I'll Always Love You," right, where the music drops out. She come. How many of you ever listened to Whitney Houston and got a goosebump? Those of you that aren't raising your hand, this altar is open if you want to come down for prayer. <laughs> Tell the truth and shame the devil. Celine, did, right? But just because you get a goose bump doesn't mean God's in it. Just because something is good doesn't mean that it's God. Right? And so, well, Pastor Adam, what are you talking about? Well, Jonah thought finding a boat going in the direction he wanted to go in was good, but it wasn't God. But he still wound up where he needed to be. Right? All right, that wasn't even in my notes. That was a little rabbit trail. So get back on track, Adam. There are four words that were used in the Hebraic to define the word consecration. Number one is, and I'm not even going to look at Travis because I know that I'm not going to say any of these right. Uh, Haram, which means to devote. The second one is Nazar, which means to separate. The third one is Quad Hesh, which means to be set apart. And number four is Mil Yada, which means to fill the hand. And that was used in ordaining the priest. And so consecration was applied to several aspects of the Jewish life. Number one, it was applied to places in the Holy of Holies, which was the innermost part of the temple. The second place that consecration was applied was to the priests and to the prophets. The third thing, there, the third place that consecration was applied was the altar of, sense, uh, of incense in the Ark of the Co Covenant. And number four, I believe, is now one of those times which is various feasts and special high holy days such as Yom Kippur or Passover. Consecration is evidence in a continual striving for the completion of Christ's work in a person's life. And I, I don't like the way that that word is used there, striving, because when you strive for something, you're doing it in your own strength. But I believe that what he wants us to strive at is he wants us to strive in walking in the fact that we're sons and we're daughters. Right? My, my two sons and my daughters never have to question whether or not they're my son or my daughter because I tell them every day. And they know. They know their daddy's voice. They don't have to strive to wonder, am I still my dad? Am, am I still my dad's? Am I still his daughter? They know. Right. There's there's actually a time um, that the, the the Hebraic people, it's called a Moedim and it's called an appointed time. Right. And typically those times that that phrase is reserved for certain times, such as Sukkot and Shavuot and and uh, Passover. But I believe that when we take time and we make time. I believe that we can step into a Moedim. What is a Moedim? A Moedim is this. A Moedim is an appointed time where God is closer than at other times. Right? So the sun is the same in January as it is in July. But we feel it more in July than we do in January because we're more tilted towards the sun. That's how they explain a Moedim. So I believe that over these, I know we're in day seven, you guys are going 10 days. 
So why not believe that for the next three and a half days that we can have, that you guys can have the Moedim come down and sit at 787 East Broad Street, right? That's the address here. I probably should know that before I throw it out so I don't ask the glory of God to sit in some other place. Amen? Consecration is a responsibility that we all have. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. Some of you that have been in church your entire life, you're like, I know what you're going to talk about, right? You know the scripture. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, and I'm reading from the Amplified, I love this, which is your rational, logical, and intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. I love there where it said progressively changed, right? Because the moment that we ask him into our heart, our spirit is renewed, right? Our spirit is made new, but it takes an entire lifetime to renew our soul, right? So the moment that one becomes saved, your condition, or I'm sorry, your position is secured in heaven, but then it takes a lifetime for your condition to match up with your position. That's what Paul is saying here when he's saying gradually, progressively being made new. So Paul is calling us not just to surrender our physical bodies to God, but also the entirety of our mortal existence. Jesus wants all of us, not 99.9% .9 of us, right? What if that 0.1% is enough to keep you from your destiny? Wow. Listen, 99.9% .9 obedience is still 100% rebellion no matter how you cut it, Amen. right? So what does consecration mean? Number one, consecration means sacrificial living. Jesus wants us to give him all of us, and therefore he wants everything from us. He wants all that we have, all that we are, and all that we do and will do to be surrendered to him. Consecration determines success. If your past, present, and future are surrendered to him, you are guaranteed to, to, to succeed. That doesn't mean that it won't come with trouble. It just means that you'll get to where he wants you to be. Right? The biggest lie the church has sold the American culture is this, is come to Jesus and leave it, live an easy life. Listen, he never promised smooth sailing. He only promised a smooth landing. Right? When we are, when we, when we are holding stuff back from him, in essence, we're saying, I trust you in all of these other areas, but this one area I want to keep for myself because I know better than you on how to manage this. He's saying, listen, you either want all of me or you want none of me, right? You either will consecrate everything or you'll consecrate nothing. 
right? And so when we don't give him everything he's asking for, we're saying, you know what? You're not worth everything. You're worth 99.9% of it, but this 1%, I want to hold this back because this sin makes me feel good. This sin allows people to come and talk to me, and this sin becomes my pet. And this area that I'm not willing to consecrate becomes my pet, and pretty soon that little thing becomes a big thing. I received a, you know, you get those, you know, you get those forwards all the time. And I got a forward a couple of years ago, and maybe I should have told my wife I was going to share the story because what I'm getting ready to, to say, uh, she doesn't like a certain uh, reptile. But, uh, and that reptile starts with the words and ends with ache. She hates snakes. But I got an email. And it was a story, and again, you know, it was one of those, if you, you know, forward this to 10 people to tell them about the love of Jesus, and I'm like, I don't need to forward nothing to tell people the love of Jesus, right? But the story was so true, and, and it, goes, it goes with, if we allow sin to become our pet, it will kill us, right? Because the Bible says the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly, right? So it's a story of a of a woman that, that had a snake and she was lonely. She went through a, a breakup and she kept the snake and it was a big python. And, and what she began to do was she began to allow the snake to sleep in the bed with her. And it would cuddle up next to her and they would, and first of all, that's just weird. I mean, as I'm talking about it, I'm like, that's just, she, she needs help. She needs she needs to see a counselor. There's some trauma that she needs to deal with. Talk to my wife. She can help you, right? Like, and, and so as I'm saying it, I'm just thinking like, this is a really weird story. But she would sleep with this snake. And the more she did it, the snake began to not eat. And so it went two or three days and the snake wasn't eating and it was just lethargic and she wouldn't even, uh, she wouldn't even get it out, of, out of her bed and put it back in its cage. And so she took it to the vet and the vet looked at everything and looked at the snake and asked this woman, what have you been doing with this snake? And she said, well, I've been in a really lonely season and this snake, I've been sleeping with it. And the, doc, the vet said, how long? And she, I can't remember the time frame, but it said this, it said, your snake isn't sick. Your snake has stopped eating because it was getting ready to eat you. Jesus. How many times do we allow that sin that we don't want to consecrate and we sleep with it and it becomes our security blanket and then before we know it, it's eaten us. You know, people don't backslide in a big, spectacular moment, correct? You backslide one decision not made at a time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29, it says it like this. It says, but God has selected the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, revealing their ignorance. And God has selected for his purpose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, reveal, reveal, revealing their frailty. God has selected for his purpose the insignificant or base things of the world and the things that are despised and treated with contempt, the things that are nothing so that he might reduce to nothing the things that are so that no one may be able to boast in the presence of God. Are we willing to die to ourselves to see God's promises and destiny for our lives come to pass? Are we willing to say all of you and none of me? So many times we like to say, 
99% of you and 0.1% of me. And he says, you're not going to be able to glory in my presence if there's 1% of you and nothing of me. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21 says it like this. It says, for to me to live is Christ. He is my source of joy, my reason to live. And to die is gain, for I will be with him in, e in eternity. Paul is call calling us to live our lives as a way to please him. To live our lives as a poured out offering. And being a living sacrifice is a daily choice and an issue of the heart. Because each and every day we get up, we choose to either live for God or live for ourselves every day. Every day it's a choice. Will I live for my flesh or will I live for the Lord? Right? And here's the amazing thing. After we come out of times like this and moments of consecration like this and we're in here and we're saying, Lord, I'll live for you no matter what. He'll then, when you get out in the street, he'll then give you an opportunity to be a person of your word. Well, how do you know? Well, because he's done it to me more times than not. Right? prayer and then he's like all right I'll call your bluff and then a person needs prayer and you're like no not that one Lord right anybody ever tried to negotiate with the Lord on praying I have all the time well not not all the time it used to be all the time so De Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse number 16 it says so circumcise that is, remove sin from your heart and be stiff-necked, stubborn or obstinate no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality or take a bribe. God requires us to live circumcised. Because circumcision is an act of purity. And circumcision hurts. And circumcision is bloody. And circumcision is not easy. And just because something isn't easy doesn't mean something isn't doable. Right? Listen, it's not easy to do 10 days of consecration, but it's doable. And you find yourself, you find there towards the end, I believe that towards the end, God is going to give some of you a second wind to get through that last push. Amen? I'm almost done, but I'm going to take my time. So I said, I'm going to take my time. I'm almost done, but I'm going to take my time. <laughs> Ain't nothing good on TV anyway, so you don't have to worry about it. But he is a Jew, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse number 29. It says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and true circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the fulfillment of the letter of the law. His praise is not from men, but from God. Listen, some of us want to live the law until the law comes for a sacrifice, right? Well, that person, they deserve what's coming to them. Well, where would you be if you got everything that you deserve coming at you? Listen, remember this, the grace that you withhold today could be the grace you need tomorrow. Right, listen, I'm not, I'm not one of those greasy, grace, sloppy, agape preachers, but I do believe that grace is not a power to sin, it's a license to, or it's not a license to sin, it's a power to live right. 
right? So circumcision is an act of purity. Consecration, circumcision, and compromise are all choices that we all must make. Let me ask you this. Who do you love more, Jesus or the world? Well, I love Jesus. Bless God. I'm 10 days of consecration. I love, okay. How about day 11 when consecration is over and that sin that you're not willing to give up during this time starts rearing its ugly head again? Right? I believe that some of us that have, that have sin that isn't being dealt with, I believe that in the presence of God, he can break that thing off of you and you never have to worry about it again. But you must make a choice and say, I am sick and tired of dealing with this thing. I'm going to lay it on the altar and not pick it back up. Right? So many times, you know what we do is we come to the altar and we lay it before the Lord and we weep and we cry and we snot and we got, right, we get, we get tears and, and all those things. And then when everyone leaves, we come back down to the altar and we pick up that thing that we, that we, that we sacrificed and said, this makes me feel good. Never giving God the ability to give you a better feeling than that thing does. Right? Listen, sin is fun for a season. But every season must come to an end. And sometimes, especially here in Ohio, seasons are cold, right? I mean, it was, it was like 50 degrees last week, and I'm like, the devil is a lie, right? The older I get, the more I understand why more seasoned saints move to Florida from October to April. Because listen... If my nose is cold at noon while I'm working in my home, I'm like, Lord Jesus, why am I still in Ohio? And then I realize I still have a mandate in Ohio. And I'm like, but Lord, can we like for six months move it south? And then, right, you know, right? The Lord is, right? How many of you believe the Lord's on my presence? So he can still be in Ohio when I'm not. But when I come back, it just, it, the anointing would just come up a little bit more because I'm back in the state borders, y'all. I'm joking. I'm totally joking. But seriously, I believe that could happen. Anyway, I'm just joking. So number one, consecration means sacri sacrificial living. Number two, consecration means separated living. We are facing a very real problem in the church right now. Not this church, but the church in America, because we have churches all across the United States that are willing to sell out and compromise for the sake of numbers. Because they don't want to, they don't want to lose that blue check next to their name on social media. You got preachers that when they began to come up and when they began to get a voice, they would preach the unadulterated word of God. But now all they're doing is they're preaching to itching ears. Right? There are entire denominations right now, just recently, that are moving so far away from the word of God. That I believe it's going to be those that they're going to look and they're going to say, but Lord, I did this in your name and I did that in your name and I cast out devils and I, I served at Shiloh and I, I went to the 10 days of consecration. I did all of these things and he'll say, but I never knew you. I never had an intimate knowledge of who you are. There are two people in this room right now. That if everything got loud and it was crazy loud, there are two voices, possibly three, that I would be able to pick out who they are because of the relationship that I have with them. Number one is my wife, Kelly, Victoria, and Travis, because I've known Travis since I was about 16. Right? So why, why would I be able to know the three of them over all of you? Because we have a knowledge of one another. We know the voice. How many times have we heard his voice, but we've pushed it to the side because we really don't think that's him? Asking us to give stuff up, and you, that you, right? So consecration is 
separate living. Is compromising for the sake of numbers worth it? Right? If we allow the world to determine our values and virtues, we will never experience true consecration. Right? We'll be a lot like decaffeinated coffee. We'll have the form but deny the power thereof. Right? You know what I'm talking about? How many of you like drinking coffee? How many of you like drinking decaf coffee? Heavenly Father, touch Travis right now, Lord. Sanctify his taste buds. Right? But listen, I like coffee, but if I want to have a cup of coffee at 6 o'clock at night, I'll do what's called half and half. Half calf, half decaf. Right? How many churches across America right now are half and half? They're half in and half out. Right? There's a, there's a story that I read in a book called God's Favorite House by Tommy Tinney. And it's talking about, I, I love the story and I've shared the story and Kelly and Victoria could probably tell you the story as I'm telling it because I tell it a lot just because it's amazing. And Tommy Tinney tells the story of a, of a friend that the family had that was a very, um, trying to figure out the politically, he was a very robust man. You guys understand what I mean by that? Like he was, he was robust. He was, he was a very tall, big guy. And he said that what this man would do is he would walk into someone's home and stand in the doorway and scan the room for a place that he could sit that could support his weight. And Tommy Tinney goes on to say, I wonder how many churches in America the Holy Spirit comes in every Sunday and stands in the doorway looking for a place that has been built that could support his weight. Are we willing to allow the weight of the presence to come on us? Because there's a weight in the weight, right? There's a W-E-I-G-H-T, weight in the weight, W-A-I-T. Leviticus chapter 11 and verse number 44, it says, for I am the Lord your God, so consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarms or crawls on the ground. God requires all of us to do what we have to do to make ourselves holy. That word holy there means this. It means to be separate. If we look like the world to win the world, what are we winning them to? Right? If we... As we become separated to him, we are conformed to his image more and more. And so we are called to live differently than the world around us. When society can't tell the difference between the world and the church, we have a serious problem. Right? If you were on, if you were put, if, if someone came in this building right now and put you on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to, to convict you of being a Christian? If they pulled up your social media pages on these screens, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or would they say, I can't tell you from the person that doesn't go to church? Right? We are called to be God's ambassadors. We are, we are called from a different country. So therefore, we are called from a different kingdom. So therefore, we must act accordingly. Right? Because when you're an ambassador, you have the same power of the country that you come from, even though you're in a different territory. Right? And so... Why is it that the same problems that are in the world are also in the church, right? Selfishness, pride, greed, malice, anger, resentment, backbiting, prejudice, slander, gossip, 
lust, lying, right? You got these parking lot prophets that they prophesy instead of prophesy, right? You know what I'm talking about? They're not submitted to anybody and they wonder why they don't have any fruit in their words, right? Because they come into churches and all they want to do is, is kill the church instead of glorify the church. So it's because we don't see us as having the problem. It's always someone else's problem, right? A prophet comes in and starts preaching against heart issues and you stand up and you're like, yeah, I hope y'all are listening because I don't have any heart issues. I'm good. My heart is good. The lead singer for YouTube, Bono, said this. He said, your Jesus I like, it's his followers I can't stand. It's because he's seen too many people that weren't consecrated. He's seen too many people that said, all of you and none of me. Kelly, go ahead and come on up. Because then that means that they'll think I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm trying. Just a, just a couple more points and then I'll turn it back over. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says, For his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely, say absolutely, absolutely. everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true root. Yes, I wanted to make sure I was reading Yes, okay, I wanted to make sure. Through true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his glory and excellence. For by these he has bestowed on us his precious and magnificent promises of inexpressible value. So that by them you may escape from the immortal freedom that is in the world because of disreputable desire and become sharers of the divine nature. We should all strive to know him more and participate in coming and becoming like him. Do we live our lives in refusal to conforming to this world? Right? Now, I'm not saying that we walk around all the time with those big family Bibles. You know, you know, what, you know what I'm talking about? The big family Bibles? You know? Big ones. They're like the size of this podium, right? You know what I'm talking about? The big one. I'm talking about like the big ones. Like they're not tall like this, but they're white. You know what I'm talking about? I had one growing up, and we always, it's so funny. I actually, I don't, I've never told my wife this, but at Christmas, we would always open it up to the book of Matthew and put it under our Christmas tree because Christmas celebrates Jesus in December when we should celebrate him in September, right? That's why Christmas music at my house comes on in September, because that's when Jesus came biblically. I'm joking. I, I'm, I actually listen to it incognito until about the middle of October, and then it just then it goes all full bore, right? I don't even know why I said that. Why was I talking about that? Oh, I, I know why. So living a consecrated life isn't about just walking around holding our Bible. Right? And speaking in tongues, and every time someone says something to us, you're like, ah, blah, 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 right? That's not consecrated. Consecrated living is always being ready. Always be ready. You know what happened? Do you know what? You know, I know, listen, I know Pastor Rod Parsley used to always say that the, the spirit of expectancy is the breeding ground of miracles. You know what miracles happen? When preparation meets opportunity. You want to be a miracle person? Be prepared and then be looking for opportunity. Always have your head on a swivel. Always know what's going on. And the last thing is this. Consecration means sanctified thinking. The main step to consecration doesn't come from us or our own efforts, but
but from the work of Holy Spirit on the inside of us. The word transform in Hebrew, and again, I know I'm not going to even try to get this, but it's where we get our word metamorphosis. So Paul is encouraging us to be changed into becoming like Christ, and that kind of transformation comes from the inside out. Right? It starts at our heart and then works on the rest of us. Used to sing a song growing up, right? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be, right? Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars, right? How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. And then if you were real holy, you knew the verses, right? I don't know the verses still, so that means I'm not holy yet, right? But consecration is this, is Paul tells us that before true consecration can begin, our mind must be changed. Our mind, we've got to flip the switch in our mind to say, this consecration thing is pretty serious. Knowing God is pretty serious. You say you know God, but does God know you? (laughs) Technology is good, except when it isn't, right? I'm just glad that wasn't like a trumpet sound, because if we all would have just been like, missed it right well thank you Jesus touch your Jesus just help her have a help my wife Lord it's moments like this I understood what Adam meant when he said it's this woman you gave me I'm just joking guys I'm joking I'm joking I'll buy you flowers on the way home it's okay we can drive separately we drove separately guys Once our mind is renewed and transformed, the way is paved for us to become more and more like Jesus. Right? God gives us the power to change, which in turn gives us the power to become more like him. Because not only is God the God of the return, right? Wayward son's coming home, but he's also the God of the turn. Right, we're on day seven, the day of completion. Tomorrow starts day eight, day of new beginnings. Right, so tonight could be completion for some things in your life and tomorrow could be the start of the new beginning. Obeying God's will isn't always easy, but it's always possible if you're willing to submit. So what does a consecrated life look like? It means this. It it is one that seeks to bring honor to Jesus. Number one, you identify with Christ. Do people know you're a Christian by the walk you walk? St. Francis of Assisi said this. He said, preach at all times and use words only when necessary. Number two, do you imitate Christ? Do you seek to become more and more like him? And number three is the inauguration of the Holy Spirit coming in your life. Is the Holy Spirit alive and active in your life? Does he control how you live? And then in closing, I want to encourage us. So the Lord talks to me in, in ways that, that I understand. You know, I'm, I'm going to, like I said, I, I've known Travis since I was, actually I said 16, since 13. Right, Travis was part of a, of a youth ministry. Came down to the church I was at, Revival 93, right? The power of God showed up. It was amazing. The power of God showed up. It was there that I really began to see what the power, like, I'm talking like, 
people like walking by people and them falling under the power of God. Like stuff I had 13 years old. Right? And so one of the things that I learned being, being connected with that youth ministry is this. Is the Lord will talk to you in ways that you understand. Right? We, we, try to, we try to get all mystical about the way the Lord speaks to me. Right? And you, you talk in a weird act. It's like almost like when, when people, when the Lord's talking to them, they, they talk in an accent that's not their own. Right? Well, the Lord spoke to me. You're like, what in the world is that? Right? Well, I got a revelation that ain't nobody heard. Well, it's probably not a revelation from heaven. Right? Because what the Bible says a lot about. that ain't nobody ever heard than it isn't really from heaven. So the one thing that I learned being a part of this youth ministry was this, was that the Lord will talk to you in ways that you understand. I remember I was going through a time in my life and, and a lot of times the Lord will speak to me when I'm just living everyday life, right? So I'll never forget, you can't tell with these, but I, I iron my jeans and I iron my shirts and I I take good care of my stuff, right? So I'm, I'm ironing my jeans one time and my jeans come out and then I, I begin to iron the shirt and there was this one wrinkle that I couldn't get out, right? I'm spraying it with starch and I'm spraying it and it just, it wouldn't come out. And while I'm doing that, I'm just praying. And it was like it was a Holy Spirit moment. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to forget about it. I'm just going to spray some downy spray and wash. I'm going to, you know, you, you know what you do with downy spray and wash. You, you fling it or whatever, and then the wrinkles come out. And Holy Spirit said this. He said, a lot of the people in the church of America want now, right now want the downy treatment when I want them to have the ironing board treatment. Stop me in my tracks. I'm like, hang on, wait, what? Has the Lord ever said something to you and you, you come back with, wait, huh? Anybody at all? Anybody ask the Lord a question when he tries to write? Anybody? Okay, good. You're, we're all in good company. And he said, he began to talk to me, and he said the difference between downy spray and go and the ironing board is it takes less work. Right? Because what do you have to do with an ironing board? You gotta or, or iron, you, you gotta get the ironing board out, you gotta plug the iron in, you gotta let it get hot, then you gotta get your starch, you gotta get all of these things, you gotta make sure everything looks good. Because if you iron it wrong, then there'll be a crease right here in the back of your shirt, and everyone will know you're not a good ironer, right? He said, there are people right now that are looking for the easy way out. And I've called them to get on my ironing board. And allow him to apply the heat. To get those wrinkles out of your life. Stand with me if you will. And I'm just going to, I don't know what the... The decorum is, I, I don't know, but all I'm going to do is this. I'm just going to pray a general prayer, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over. But I want to encourage you guys to this. Over these next couple of days, really set your face to seeing heaven come to earth. Right? You guys are in a prime location. This church is in a prime location and I love Pastor Johnny because Pastor Johnny is the same no matter where you see him. Right? He's the same in the pulpit as he is out eating, eating lunch. And I believe this, I believe that the presence of God can sit on the boundary of this property and people can find their way in. There's a story uh, 
Anybody ever read the book Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire by Jim Cimbala, the pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle? Anybody ever read that book? It's an amazing book. It's a great book. It's a book where he talks about how Brooklyn Tabernacle, when he came in to take it over, his father-in-law was actually the founding pastor and said, Jim, I just need you to come in and pastor this. We're going to eventually close it down, but I need you to come in for like six months. And it's been there for over 40 years. So he came to this church in the middle of downtown Brooklyn, right? Said that he, he would come in and there, the mamas of the house, the, the grandmas of the house got a revelation on what it means to pray. And he said he used to, actually while he was describing the church, the way the, way the church used to look, I thought, wow, that sounds a lot like Shiloh. Because he said his office was upstairs and, and the vents were open and he would literally get down on the floor and put his ear to the vent and he would hear the grandmamas praying and walking and pray for the fire of God to fall. Because if the glory of God is going to come, the glory, the, the, the fire of God may come in on a personality, but it will only stay on the glory. This man, it's Easter Sunday, this man came, came straggling down the main aisle. He said, I'll never forget the smell. The man stunk and he was, he was, he said it smelled like alcohol and, and just, he, he was a homeless man and his hair was matted and his clothes were hanging off of him. And he came down the main aisle and he said, I'll never forget it. I came down off the stage and I just hugged him. And service was done at that moment. Right? The security tried to come and, and break it up and he just held up his hand because at that moment, nothing else mattered. So this man came down and, and Jim, not only did he hug this man, but he sat down next to him with the church of Right? We, we could understand it if, if it came in in a small group like this. But are we really willing to say, Holy Spirit, however you want to move, move that way. Well, but we got a we got a we got the man of, of faith and power coming in. But if someone comes in off the street, the man that stands behind the pulpit is not more important than that man that came struck, right? So this man, I believe his name was Larry. This man came in and Pastor Jim hugged him. And that man now is the head of their deacon board. He got up. Listen, listen, here's the crazy thing. He came in drunk and left sober. Because of the presence of God. So listen, Shiloh, I encourage you to this. Over these next couple of days, ask him for big things, right? Share one more scripture, and then I'll be done for real this time. Jeremiah 33, 3, one of my favorite scriptures. Here it is. To me, and I will answer you and tell you and even show you great and mighty things, things which have been confined and hidden, which you did not know and understand and cannot distinguish. So, for these next couple of days, I encourage all of us in this room to ask big of God and watch Him come. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this group of people. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you that for seven days they have, 
they have been in your presence. They have taken time off of work. Some of them have taken time off of work. Some of them may have come after work and they stay into the night. And Lord, I just pray that you would give the leadership and the team and the worshipers strength to, to go on these next couple of days, Heavenly Father. And Lord, I pray that there would be a special grace on Shiloh Christian Church, Heavenly Father. I pray that there would be a the fire of heaven would come and that people as they drive by, they would feel something different. As people walk by the boundary lines of this church, that they would feel something different. Heavenly Father, I thank you that, that, that you have called Pastor Johnny, you have called this church to be a church, a repair. Jesus, God, I thank you. I declare it to be so. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want to read one more scripture that came to me while I was praying. And I'm going to read it to you in the Message Bible. And I believe that that's the heart of this church. I'm going to read it to you in the Message. Isaiah 58. And verse number 12, and, and tell me, if this is, if this sounds like Shiloh, ready? You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew. You'll be, you'll rebuild the foundations from out of your past. Here it is, ready? You'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore old ruins. Rebuild and re renovate. Here it is. Make the community livable again. Isaiah 58, 12. And the message, I want you to look that up, right? That's talking about the repairs of the breach. I believe this church is a repair of the breach yes. to take the to, to connect earth with heaven and say, Lord, if you're going to do anything in Columbus, let it start here at 787 East Broad Street. Right? Listen, check it out. Look, look, look. Check out the address. Seven. Hey, this is Pastor Stephen Worley. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to ShilohHub.com. Remember to hit the bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.